Japanese planes can be very versatile. They can be put to use in a number of different ways. However, profiling the sole of a plane really dictates how it performs in different situations. Tonight, we're very excited because we've got our first Kumiko workshop here at the JTA headquarters, and we are going to have Jason from Wigwood come in to do uh, some coasters, some Asanoha coasters. These are a really simple Kumiko shape because they use a square frame and then you need three different angles to make the Asanoha pattern. There's the 45, I think a 66.5 and a 22.5. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure if that's exactly correct. Um, and to do that, you need three different jigs. Making Kumiko on jigs can be done in a number of different ways. Chisels are very popular, however, I much prefer to use planes. I feel that they're safer and more controllable, but this is just a per personal preference. I also like to use Japanese planes for making 45 degree mitres and putting together a shooting board, something like this, or even a shooting board that you'd find being used with Western planes, allows you to get really accurate 45 degree cuts. This is a little box that I've made with a shooting board, uh, and I like to make these with 45 degree cuts or rebates on the top and bottom of the box as well, and you get a nice stacking sort of symmetrical box pattern and a few different ways to do those. So what I want to do today is run through what I'm gonna to do to pl these plane soles to get them ready for the workshop tonight. And I also thought I'd just showcase some of the different ways the Japanese planes arrive to the user in terms of how the sole is profiled. If you own a Japanese plane that is commercially made, chances are that it has been relieved behind the blade. And what I mean by that is that, this is one of our beautiful 70 millimeter blue paper steel tachibana cunners. Usually you will have one plane in front of the blade, which then steps up behind it. So here on this plane, when you run your finger next to the mouth, you can feel a definite step. This is true of our Kakuri planes, this is true of our Komori planes, and it is true of our Tachibana planes. However, this, what this allows you to do is smooth really, really nicely. There are lots of subtleties that go on in this tuning pattern. However, when you start getting contact patches behind the blade, it can be that just having one contact patch behind the blade can lift the plane enough that the contact patch in front of the mouth will also lift. And that introduces a lot of compromises in your planing process. So whatever is happening behind the blade, it's really important to maintain a contact patch in front of it. This plane will be beautiful for smoothing and will be easy to tune for smoothing because it has been relieved behind the blade. Our range of Kana by Yamamoto-san is a little bit different because it has no relief behind the blade. So this block is nominally flat from the factory. However, as we know, there are many tolerances to flat and wood moves. So when tuning one of these for the first time, it will be really important to flatten off the whole block and then add your reliefs as you wish. So if you want this plane to joint and straighten, you'd maintain a point of contact behind the blade as well as one in front and at the front of the plane. Or if you want it just as smooth, you would relieve everything behind the blade and keep two contact patches in front of the blade and at the front. So this might take a little more work to get working as a smoother. However, because you have complete freedom of your in choice and tolerance, you can add your own tolerances as you wish. This is really, really uh, a really good opportunity to develop a really beautifully tuned smoothing plane to your specifications. So the plane that I use almost all the time for anything jig based is this Yamamoto plane, which I've profiled to have three contact patches. And what I've noticed is that those three contact patches make this plane much more sensitive to movement. Any movement behind the block means that the contact patch in front of the plane can lose contact with your timber. So I often find myself tuning this back very, very often, much more often than I have to tune a smoothing plane. Tonight, we are using 42 millimeter Kakuri planes. And we have gone to Kakuri and asked them to make us planes, which they don't normally do. We've asked them to deliver us planes that are not relieved behind the blade. We want these planes to be flat from the factory. Uh, this is essentially removing a step from the production process, um, but what it means is that it gives us complete control over how they're profiled. What I've noticed with these, having been able to see these in action, is that they are much more sensitive than a normal Kukuri plane. So here we have our normal 42 millimeter Kukuri plane. This is the plane that ships with our chopstick jigs, and this is the plane that we've offered for 10 years now. And it is relieved behind the blade, as are all the other Kukuris. The only Kukuri we currently offer that is not relieved behind the blade is the 42 millimeter flat bottom plane. And because we went and specified a bit of a custom profile on the sole, 
We also specified it with a blue paper steel blade, so we have an uprated blade here as well. I'm just going to run through how I'm going to tune them, and then I'm going to give them a few runs on a jig, making some Asanoha uh, infills, and then I'm also going to give them a run on a shooting board, getting some nice 45 degree cuts. Anyway, let's start running through the process. So in tuning the sole of a plane, I'm going to be doing all of the tuning with my blade already set in the block. The reason I do this is because that blade, when seated, exerts pressure on the timber below it. When it exerts that pressure, that timber can bow out. And actually on these flat bottom planes, that makes a big difference to how the timber behaves. So if I were to tune and set this plane without the blade in it, I'd probably get it nice and flat. I'd then put in the blade and that would then bow it behind the, behind the mouth again, which would undo all my good work. So here I'm going to seat this blade about a mil from the edge. That's a bit far, that's protruding, there we go. Nice and close to the edge, as close to the edge as I can get it while not actually protruding. And then I'm going to drive in the chip breaker as well. So I've got as much force exerted there on the block as I'm pretty much going to be exerting once it's fully protruding. So what I have here is I have a sheet of float glass with adhesive back sandpaper on it. So this is a known flat surface that will give me a flat reference and an abrasive to abrade the timber. And after a few passes on that, what I can see is that we have a very large flat spot behind the blade developing, but we have not yet hit any timber in front of the blade. So none of this timber in front of the blade is contacting our work material, which means that we don't have any support in front of our cut. Right at the front of the plane, I've got a nice contact patch developing and nothing at the back of the block yet. What I want eventually is I want a nice contact patch at the back, in front of the mouth and at the front of the plane. And to help me diagnose when I'm gonna, when I'm gonna achieve that, I'm gonna cover everything in pencil and keep going. So here we have some development. We've got a nice flat spot that's now kicking out to the back corner, but not the other corner. And we're starting to get contact right to the side of the blade here at the mouth, but not in front of it. And we're just gonna keep going. We've got contact probably halfway along the back, a third of the way along the mouth. Two thirds along the way of the mouth, two thirds along the way along the back. So this is not yet touching here at the back and not yet touching here at the mouth. We'll get that soon. Ooh, very, very close. We're just missing the last five mil here on the back. And a tiny amount right there. Very, very, very neat. There we go. And that's about got it. There we have it. We have a flattened sole. And when we put our straight edge on that sole, we should not get light in behind it. And what, what it looks like I've got here, it looks like I've got a slight high spot right in the middle. So I'm gonna just work that gently. Whoop. This is 120 grit sandpaper, so it's very aggressive. That's much better. So the way I was distributing my pressure with one hand while doing the rough work, seems like I had accidentally sort of rolled it slightly. So a bit of even pressure. has improved a lot. It would be really nice if I had some 240 grit sandpaper around here somewhere. Ah, oh, look at that. 
Alrighty, from the 120 to the 240s. So now that I have a flat reference surface, I'm going to add some marks that are going to show me exactly where I want to relieve some material. What I'm going to add here is a line giving me a front contact patch, a contact patch at the mouth, and a contact patch at the back of the plane. The other thing I'm going to add is a line at the mouth of the plane that I'm going to need to adjust slightly as well. So with these lines added, I'm going to relieve material between them. This is a little plane scraper. It's really handy, fits nicely in the hand, and it's got a bit of a burr on one side, which means that it'll take a fair amount of material compared to just a straight blade. However, I often do this with just a chisel, uh, and Takami Kawai-sensei, when he visited from Kyoto, uh, had his students do this process with uh, sandpaper on a block. So there we have it, with a three-point plane, I'm able to reference this kind of on the jigs quite nicely, uh, and it gives me some really crisp, very precise work for Kumiko, and some nice 45s for box making. So I hope that's useful, uh, and I hope that you're able to use any of those tips in your own woodworking. Catch you later.